have some very distinguished guests to answer all our questions. First of all, and we couldn't possibly make this programme without him, ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Moore. Patrick is going to tell us about the moon, about alien life, but first of all, we know, Patrick, that you've presented the sky at night for a record-breaking 42 years. When did you first get interested in astronomy? When I was six years old, and that was in 1929. I read a book and I was hooked. Simple as that. And it was just a book? Yes. And did you... have you trained yourself? Have you taught yourself? Yes, um... Well, I had rather disturbed education. There was a gentleman named Hitler was around when I showed me at Cambridge. So, um... I missed it, I'm So all the things that you have discovered about ast astronomy, you've basically taught yourself and passed on to us. Oh, I'm merely an amateur. I mean, I merely, I merely sort of had to go mapping the moon. That's all I did. I'm not an academic in the way that the, our, our colleagues are here. And what you have next to you, I think, is a globe of the moon, is it? Yes, the one the Russians did, because they used a lot of my observations when they made the original globe. And before they mapped the far side, it was all blank there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, they, uh, they used my uh, uh, observation to tie them in. That's a long time ago. 1959. A long time back now. You know more about the moon than we did. So but Patrick... no, no little green men, I'm afraid. All right, we'll come no, to that. No, no little green men. But, uh, so as an amateur, you were able to tell the Russians much of what they know? Well, I was, I was doing some maps of the moon. That was as far, far as I went. Right. I'm, not, I'm not an academic. I don't, I don't claim to be. But a fantastic expert, and we're delighted to have you here. Nice to be here. Next to you, we have, uh, and please welcome, the director of the British National Space Centre, Dr Paul Merton. <laughs> Dr Merton, or may I call you Paul? Paul. Can I first of all say what a fantastic waistcoat that is? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Wonderful benefit. Oh, that's <laughs> terrific. Now, you're going to answer questions, among other things, about how it all began. So, can I just ask you, how old is the universe? Well, when I used to ask my granny uh, how old she was, uh, she would always say, I'm as old as my tongue and a little older than my teeth. And the universe is as old as the matter in it. That was all created at the Big Bang. And it's a little older than the stars. And that makes it around 12, 14 billion years old, give or take a fortnight. <laughs> That. Next of all, please welcome Dr. Monica Grady from the Natural History Museum in London. <laughs> Monica, you specialise in asteroids, comets, meteors, so I'd better ask, are we in danger? Should we be worried that we're going to be hit any moment? Well, I've got a, a small one with me here. This is a meteorite, not a meteor. And 60,000 tonnes of material like this rain down on the earth every year and so if this hit you on the head then yes you would be in great de danger of death it looks very heavy isn't it, it is it is very heavy do we know where it came from it came from the asteroid belt which is between mars and jupiter well look yeah it's come a long <laughs> way <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't like that landing on your head you would feel that <laughs> but bigger, Monica, one, we bigger ones like than this might come any time fine you've been warned <laughs> take a rather strong umbrella with you or a hard hat. Next, from the Royal Greenwich Observatory, the senior astronomer, Dr. Robin Catchpole. <laughs> now, Robin, you're going to tell us about red giants. Yes, what well, is... a red giant is basically what our sun is going to become in about 5,000 million years' time, and that'll be a goodbye to the Earth. Well, that's something to look forward to. And white, uh, white dwarfs? That, that sort of comes next, because what happens, a red giant is an enormous great red star. Then the outer atmosphere completely detaches, and it leaves this very, very hot little core. Might be 100,000 degrees, and that's going to be a white dwarf. How little is little? Little, little is, oh, not much bigger than the Earth, about the size of the oh, Earth. So little. it's pretty small, yes. And, and you're also going to tell us about red dwarves. That's the only thing we have a picture of. Yes, not, um, not those, <laughs> I'm uh, sorry to say. Those, ah. are, those are much more complicated. Red dwarfs are sort of cooler versions of white ones. In fact, that was one way we used to find out how old the universe was, because white dwarfs just cool down. They spend the rest of their lives just cooling off. So the universe is full the of these dwarves and giants. It, it, it is indeed, yes. Extraordinary, isn't it? And finally, we have, last but certainly not least, Professor Mike Edmonds from Cardiff University. <laughs> and 
you're going to tell us about our galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, is it a big galaxy as galaxies go? Yeah, it's a, it's a moderate-sized galaxy. It's not the biggest we know of, and it's certainly not the smallest. It's a sort of fairly average largest one, one you might be, you know, fairly proud to live in. But we live right out in the suburbs. We're the sort of suburban animals right out on the edge of the galaxy, or very near the edge of the galaxy. It's about something like 24,000 light-years to the middle. It's a long way from the middle to the outside, and we're just one of maybe 100,000 million stars in our own galaxy. 100,000 million? So, there are a lot more to discover. Blimey, and lots more galaxies? Yes. Do we know how many? Well, it, it's difficult to estimate. I'm trying to remember the last estimate I did, but it runs into millions of millions. We might as well go home now, might we? Mind you, we are home. Aren't we? Well, let's start, Patrick, with you. What, for you, has been the most exciting moment, the most exciting discovery? Well, I suppose um, my particular subject is, of course, the moon. So I suppose I've got to say the first landing there. But I must say that um, I was on a doing a television programme live in 1959 when they got the first pictures back of the moon's far side. And they came up on the television screen when I was actually doing the programme. That was a great moment. It must have been. And we've actually got the film of the landing on the moon. Yes, indeed. Let's have a look at that moment. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That was a great line, wasn't it? Tell you what strikes me about that one, because I've been doing the commentaries when they came down, because I knew both Neil and Bars, and of course, bear in mind one thing, there was no provision for rescue, had one chance. If they'd made a faulty landing, they couldn't have got back. So when I heard Neil's voice coming through, the eagle has landed, that was a moment of intense relief, believe me. And the other crackdown, when they had blasted away again, they had one ascent engine on that thing, and that had to work properly first time, or they didn't get back. But no provision to rescue, and I'm quite sure we are not going to go back to the moon until there is provision for rescue, because sooner or later, something would have gone wrong. Absolutely, it's... Exactly. Terrifying thought. It's slightly unscrupulous, is it? To Terrifying send, thought. Send people out there with no possible rescue. It never occurred No, there's no rescue provision at all. Do you think they will go back to the moon? Do you think I'm sure they will. I think before very long, too. But after all, we've learned so much then. Don't forget, the first men got to the moon over 30 years ago. And in those days, technology, by our present standard, was quite frankly primitive. I'm sure we will go back there. And I'm sure there will be a lunar base in the first part of the new century. And what will that be for? Scientific research, particularly. And uh, also, don't forget the purely international collaboration here. After all, the Cold War is over. Space stations and space research is going to be purely international now. And that can do nothing but good. So would you like to go to the moon? We need a very massive rocket to launch me. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to we have the technology, would you I like? I would love to go on, yes. You'd there, love there, to. There is a limit. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> right. We have a question. Yes, madam. Um, apart from Neil and Buzz and friends, has there ever been any evidence for life on the moon? Just one moment, madam. I have a feeling that that is not the first time that Patrick has been asked that particular question. In fact, we have some film of you answering that question in Good 1961. Good heavens. Now, the question that's been put to me so often is quite simply this. We couldn't exist on the moon. Well, that's quite reasonable. Conditions are wrong for us. But surely you could have some other kind of life which could exist quite well under lunar conditions and wouldn't have to bother about an atmosphere. In fact, there could be alien life of the kind that storytellers call the BEMs, or bug-eyed monsters. Well, now, let me say here and now that we can't prove that bug-eyed monsters don't exist, but we do think that they are improbable, and I'd like to explain why. Uh, why, Patrick? Because we know a great deal about the way in which life is built up. And life is built upon one particular element, the element carbon. And life must be built upon that. Now, that is our theory. If that is wrong, then all our modern science is wrong too. And there's no evidence about that. I'll give you an analogy. I believe tomorrow morning the sun's going to rise in the east. Now, it may rise in the west. If it does, all our modern science is wrong. I don't believe that. Therefore, all the evidence is against that. And all the evidence is against entirely alien life. Therefore, frankly, I don't think it's there. I'd love to see a bug-eyed monster, but I fear I won't. Right. Now, that's, that's what you asked about the moon, isn't it? Um, what about Mars? Ah, uh, well, of course, we have experts here. Mars, 
Certainly no little green men, nothing to advance the blade of grass. We can't yet prove that Mars is entirely lifeless. There may be very simple single-celled creatures there, but wait and see. But uh, nothing advanced. I'm sure we'll have a Martian base in the, in the first year or future, but nothing at all advanced. But there, we can't yet say that Mars is totally sterile, can we? That's right. But I wonder. Monica, what... I'm 50-50. I, I hope there's something there. Right. Paul, what, what, do you agree with this? I think there's likely to be life on Mars. There's like, likely to have been life on Mars, at least. Oh, and, yes. and, and, of course, the Beagle lander, which is a, a British spacecraft uh, which will set out for Mars when? in the year 2003, will actually try to demonstrate that things have happened on Mars which are a consequence of there having been life there at one time. Certainly oh. the conditions were ripe for it. Well, we have got news film of pictures sent back from Mars by the Pathfinder probe, and that explored Mars with its robots in July 1997. It's the most spectacular view yet of the Martian surface, the first colour panorama made by combining a series of pictures sent back by the landing craft. In the distance, hills, and in the foreground, the rocks and debris left by floods that swept through the area several billion years ago, churning up the landscape. It's here that the NASA robot has been studying a large rock that the scientists call Yogi. Uh, this shows us backing away from uh, the, uh, Yogi and uh, the rover is backing away here, actually turning in place, doing some, a series of soil mechanics in that region. Still images have been combined to make the first video of the robot at work. Guided remotely by scientists at Mission Control, the robot places a special probe on the surface of a rock dubbed Scooby-Doo to find out what it's made of. Paul, can you explain to me, with all this technology, why we call rocks Yogi and Scooby-Doo? <laughs> well, I think it's just more friendly than calling them rock number one and rock number five, isn't it? Um, it it's something to... Um, uh, th there may have been something in the pictures that reminded people of the shape of Scooby-Doo or Yogi Bear. It is Yogi, definitely, I think. If you look at that the silhouette there, it's awfully like Yogi Bear. <laughs> Tell me about it, Patrick. It isn't, it isn't that astronomers and space scientists are all small boys, really, is it? There's a certain element in that, I have to say. <laughs> also small girls. And small girls. <laughs> well, all right, so, so what we saw there is what we know about rocks and floods that happened. Oh, yes, yeah. yes a, a long time ago there were, uh, there, there were great big floods on Mars. There, was, there were pools of water, possibly lakes, possibly even seas. Um, and for some reason these seas disappeared. Um, and now Mars is the dry, dusty place that we just saw on that video clip, full of interesting looking rocks. Um, and maybe in the subsoil underneath, maybe uh, bacteria and other forms of life. But plenty so, of ice. Plenty of ice, it's very cold. Um, maybe some liquid water, maybe some hot springs underneath the surface that would warm the ice to make liquid water and therefore develop life, maybe even still to this day sustain it in some places. Now you're but, talking about water, H2O, the stuff we have yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there could have been plants, there could have been, could there? Certainly bugs, um, certainly, certainly microbes, certainly... Um, uh, certainly uh, bacteria sort of thing. But well, nothing on the surface Monica. now, though. Because Mars's surface is sterile because there's no atmosphere. So the sun's radiation sterilizes the surface. So that's another reason why there's nothing on the surface. But there might be something below the surface protected within the rocks from the radiation. So are we going to, when we send our explorer, are we going to dig down? That's right. That's what Beagle 2 is going to do. It's got something on board called a mole, which is going to burrow under the soil to actually look to look at the, the, the ice-coated soil. And it might find bugs? It might yeah. find... Not bug eye. ...signatures of bugs. It might find the signature of carbon in, within that soil that, that Patrick was talking about at the start. It doesn't but, sound as if you're very optimistic that it'll find Martians. It's certainly... Well, we're fairly certain it's not going to find <laughs> Martians, but... But, but, let, me say, but it might. Let, let me say why I think that's really a fantastic discovery, because yeah. that life that it finds, if it can find some, will be in some ways the same as us, but like carbon-based or something, mm. and in many ways different. And when you've got some sort of life you can compare and contrast yeah. with ours, then you've got something which will tell you about our life, because you've got something that's different from it that you can compare and contrast. And in that knowledge, I think, is fantastic potential for pharmacology, for human medicine, for the development of drugs, uh, for things that are really useful. It's going to be a kind of a thing that rattles our brains and makes us understand our own life better. One what thing does strike yeah. me, though, Patrick. as you said, in our galaxy, there are 100,000 million stars, and many of those must have planets going around them. So there must be many worlds in our galaxy alone where life can appear. But if life can appear, will it? 
That's what we can't prove. And if we find in our own solar system, life has appeared twice, here and on Mars, in any form, that'll be a pointer, I think. Mind uh, you, it might have been transferred rather, from one to the other. It might have been, yes. Uh, true, by true. meteorites or something true. like well, that. Well, speaking of meteorites, what was the catastrophe, Paul, that you think stopped all the water and the floods and the rivers and things and turned Mars into this yeah. du dusty thing? Well, that's a jolly good question. Um, and it's either something to do with wobbles in the way Mars goes around the, um, uh, the sun and terrific climate changes that take place as a result. Global uh, warming? Global warming on a, I, I mean, a really planetary sort of scale. Or it might be something to do with the impact of a great big asteroid into Mars, which was... I was going Again, to ask Monica whether, yeah. whether you are holding in your lap a small version of what <laughs> fell upon Mars. Well, we think it's more likely that Mars actually lost its atmosphere yeah, through, through uh, it lost its water when it lost its atmosphere through some stripping process, not necessarily a catastrophic impact. Mm -hmm. Although we have had huge catastrophic impacts on the Earth in the past, including one 65 million years ago, which, which did for the dinosaurs. Now, that was a, 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 a rock that was 10 kilometers across, not, not just... Uh, Where did that fall? Like that. that fell in um, Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico, at a place called Chicxulub. Well, we have um, a film of another crater which was created in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Now, this was also created, was it by something falling out of space? Yes, this is, this is Meteor Crater in Arizona, and it was created about 50,000 years ago by something that was about 35 metres across, so something perhaps the size of this studio. <coughs> and the material that created this was um, a 35 metre chunk of solid iron metal. And the, the energy of the impact when that hit the ground in Arizona converted the metal, the solid metal, into gas, into iron gas, which then um, soaked into all the surrounding rocks during the formation of that crater. And there's a huge amount of that meteorite which can still be picked up. And that must have caused a complete catastrophe. That caused, that caused a local catastrophe. Yeah. I mean, that, that crater is about one and a half kilometres across and, and um, 200 metres deep. So if that fell on Shepherd's Bush, um, that would be absolutely catastrophic for the inhabitants of Shepherd's Bush and, and the locals around. It would not affect the people in, in Edinburgh or, or Cardiff or, or Belfast. But the one that created would, the Gulf of Mexico, not the dinosaurs. Yes, yes. Now, that, th there that is was because it was so much bigger, a exactly. much, much bigger impact. Is it right that we've got a committee, an Armageddon committee that's... That's right, we do, yes. We have, we have a, a committee which has just been set up by the government, which is investigating the, the, uh, investigating the risk, if you like, of, of an impact and the, the probability and what we could actually do about it. And well, it what is, could we do? It's a very serious issue because we need to know the probability of these impacts, how often they're going to happen, what the sort of material is that is impacting, and what we could do about, about deflecting or moving something in its orbit. If we know that something's going to happen next Tuesday, we can't do anything about it. If we know something's going to happen in two years' time or 20 years' time, then yes, we can plan and do something about it. We're talking almost serious science fiction in terms of launching rockets, not to blast an asteroid into oblivion, but just to, to nudge it, move it slightly in its orbit. Um, just only if you've got, if, if it's far enough away, you only need to move it a few centimetres in its orbit so that it will miss the Earth rather than hitting the Earth. So we need to know more about the material that, that's out there within our own solar system. At this point, may I remind viewers that this is not science fiction. This programme is about science fact, about the universe as we know it. It's a lovely thought, isn't it, that we're looking up there, planning to nudge... Comets, are they? Meteors? Well, we have seen, we have seen one impact. In that, in that, um, a comet was observed to hit Jupiter. Yes. Comets Shoemaker-Levy 9 impacted Jupiter and caused tremendous disturbances in Jupiter's Jupiter Excuse was had a surface. That sounds like a Jewish comet. You, uh, shoemaker Levy, you know, was discovered by, <coughs> by two astronomers, well, three, uh, my old friend Gene Shoemaker, now dead, sadly, and his oh. wife, and David Levy, and they're a comet hunting team, and they found this one. They're a ninth discovery, hence shoemaker Levy 9. Uh, that was on a path around Jupiter in a collision course, and it did actually impact Jupiter, and we saw the effects, and they lasted for many months. And the effects that we could see on Jupiter were great huge plumes of gas, enormous quantities of energy, hundreds of million times more energy than was released in the, the biggest 
energetic impact, the man-made impact we know, which was the uh, Hiroshima bomb. And if that hadn't been sucked up by Jupiter, hadn't been absorbed by Jupiter, the chances are that could have come in and, and impacted the Earth. Do we need a space station? Do we need somewhere to go? Well, we actually, we have Jupiter, which, which soaks up a lot of these impacts yeah. and, 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 and protects us, if you like, from a lot of these, this impact. Because material. it's bigger and attracts them? Yes, yes. Right. I remember yes. seeing that one come in. We were over at Hurstman, sir, using the big telescope there, and as the thing came round, we saw the first scar, of the first <coughs> impact upon Jupiter. Mm. Quite amazing. One lovely comment made, where there were several of these things, a kind of string of Bs, labeled A to W, and A for impact at first, and somebody wrote in and said, how do we know the book impact in strict alphabetical order? <laughs> 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 All right, we've got Jupiter dragging a lot of this stuff away, but I still wonder whether we ought to be preparing the moon or somewhere for humanity to run to in case something really big is heading our way. Is there anywhere we could go? If something really, really enormous hit the Earth, then there's a good chance it might affect the moon if it was if it was really ah. really big enough perhaps we need to be looking further away looking perhaps towards mars i don't know but that hasn't got an atmosphere and it looks a bit dry is there anywhere no, more homey that's true no there's a no planet? way good enough no there isn't no. is there one called europa which is a little bit that's, ah. that's not a planet that's that's a satellite of um jupiter and that's even more hostile than oh. than mars that's covered in ice it's freezing cold it possibly has a, a subsurface ocean so uh, if we can become submariners, then, then maybe it would be But more. nowhere really welcoming. There's nowhere, there's nowhere as good as home. Well, okay. there's Venus, of course, and about the same size of the Earth, with a tremendous <laughs> atmosphere made of large of, sul of, of sulfuric acid and carbon. If you go there, you'll be fried, poisoned, squashed and corroded. So we have, but at least you wouldn't be hit by an um, asteroid. Well, you might be. Well, you might be. Oh, you <laughs> could be. <laughs> but we, have, we have Venus, which is much too hot. We have Mars, which is much too cold. And we have the Earth, which is just right. And this has been described as the Goldilocks syndrome. Right. After all, after all, in our solar system, Earth is the only planet that is capable of supporting intelligent life. Whether it does is another matter. <laughs> We're not going down there. <laughs> One way we have discovered a few of the secrets of the universe is through the Hubble telescope, which I thought was either down at Celsius with Patrick or on the top of a mountain in California. But it turns out to be higher yet and even more expensive because it's in space. It was actually launched 10 years ago. And lift off of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Right, so we took this um, elaborate, intricate telescope up into space. Um, what is it, Robin, that makes it so much more effective up there rather than the telescope on Earth? I mean, this is, I suppose, what um, a star looks like on Earth. Why does it look so much better if it's seen through Hubble? In one word, because it's above the Earth's atmosphere. So we don't suffer from the turbulence um, uh, uh, that the Earth's atmosphere creates. So we can get the full resolution of this, um, well, not such a large mirror, but two and a half meter mirror. Oh, so it's not absolutely enormous. No, no, no. By modern standards, it's actually quite small. It's two and a half meters in diameter. The, uh, the sort of workhorse telescopes of today have mirrors eight meters in diameter, and the biggest ones in here are 10 meters. But the great advantage it has is location. A location, yeah. Now, what are the most interesting photographs, you think, that it's but, brought back? I've certainly got uh, uh, my favourite photograph here, which uh, is one that, um, it, 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 to me, it's, it's one of the most beautiful images that the Hubble's obtained. And I think it's, it's beautiful for me because, for the first time, it really shows a three-dimensional um, structure to the, to the universe. You see these two things that are referred to as pillars, and I don't really like them being called pillars because pillars have the sense of standing on the ground. It's the one that looks as if it's underwater and it, those it, are sort it, of coral It does. Sculptures. In, in fact, uh, I always think the, the blob on the right looks a bit like what happens when you drop some ink into water. What we're looking at is the very origin of stars. This is the, these are the places where stars are currently being born out of this, these great... Uh, pillars, these great fingers of dust and gas that are shrinking under their own gravity. And they're just out in space. We're not looking at something on a planet. No, no, we're looking, we're, we're inside our galaxy. We're, we're quite a long way away. We're a few thousand light years away, but we're well inside our own galaxy. Our galaxy is full of these great clouds of dust and gas that are places where 
gravity is drawing the material together where stars are being born out of the debris of previous generations of stars. And if you look very carefully, I don't know if, if people can see this, right up on the top of the, of the left-hand blob, you'll see some little spikes sticking out. And yeah. these are the very places, if we were to look in, not too far in the future, we would see stars at these places. This is where star birth is, is actually occurring. Mind you, when you say not too far in the future, what are you, what are you talking? Well, I mean, not too far in terms of the 4,000 million years since our sun looked That's like what this. I thought you maybe mentioned. just a, a few hundreds of thousands, maybe a million years or so. Oh, near nothing. You've got another one. And I've got us. another one. Now, this is a star in a, a very different stage of its life. I mean, we've been perhaps looking at stars like our sun being born here, but here is a very massive star. And the great thing is the more mass there is, the, the more violent and energetic a star is. And this, is, this thing's known to astronomers as a wolf rayet star. It's, it's very, very hot, about 50,000 degrees or so. It's so hot that it's sort of blasting away its atmosphere, uh, which is this great fuzzy thing you can see around it, um, you know, almost before it's got going. It's, so it's wilder than the sun? Oh, it, it, this wilder. is really wild. I mean, there would be no planetary systems, nobody living anywhere near this star. And in fact, its life's going to be over and done with maybe in 20 million years this thing is just going to explode in one enormous explosion and scatter all its material into space again. Professor Mike uh, Edmonds you've, you've got some photographs there also from Hubble? Also from Hubble uh, this is one of my favorites uh, a favorite of many astronomers too the Hubble deep field one of the deepest pictures ever taken of the universe uh, the uh, a past director of the Space Telescope had the very good idea, he had some observing time, and he decided he'd sort of donate it to the community. And what he'd do is just put the telescope and stare into one part of space just as long as he could on the, on the telescope. And they went for about a total of about 35 hours just seeing how far they could see. And if you like, this is a picture from our family album. This is, this is the nursery. Most of the objects you're looking at in here, you're looking back very near the beginning of the universe. A lot of these objects here were around when you're looking back to maybe a tenth of the age of the universe. So can I just remind people, the further you look, the further back in time you're looking. That's Is that right. right. Light takes a, a certain time to travel, and yes. if you look further and further, it's taken longer and longer to get to you, and it's our way of looking back in the past by looking to further and further distances. And uh, a revolution has really happened in astronomy over the last ten years or so, in that uh, when I was a graduate student, nobody ever believed you'd be able to see a, a galaxy this distance, at these sort of distances. Wouldn't be possible. Now we can regularly see things back to maybe a tenth, a twentieth of the age of the universe, and really begin to see how galaxies formed, how the structure in the universe was collecting together, really begin to view the whole history of how galaxies form and evolve over the time of the universe. So I find that a, a wonderful sort of as-we-were picture. Right, rather sweet we were, weren't we? And you've got another picture there? There's another one here, um, when we're a bit older. Um, this one is, uh, again, a, a very massive star. This is to be one of the most massive stars ever found yet. It's called the Pistol Nebula, and at its centre, it's near the centre of our galaxy, it has a star which is about 100 times at least as massive as our sun, so it's one of the big, big stars. Is it as wild as the other one we saw? It